get more confidence, get that promotion, get moving up the corporate ladder, get a better gig with an MBA from Mays Business School at Texas A&M University. Whether you're starting out or stepping up, now you can take your career to a whole new level with a full-time MBA in College Station and convenient weekend options at Houston City Center. Texas A&M has a program to suit your schedule. Visit mba.tamu.edu and Giga Maggie. Howdy, welcome to May's Mastercast. I'm Shannon Deere, the NRM Associate Dean for Undergraduate Programs, here with your remarkable host, Ben Wiggins. Hi, Ben. Good morning, Shannon. How are you? <laughs> I'm well. How's it going? <laughs> It's great. We it's could just great. do the whole intro rolling our R's. We could. I don't know if we that could. would go over well. Over well. Over. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I end up sounding like more Irish or something. I <laughs> sounded like I'm a video game or a, a cartoon just now. <laughs> <laughs> that actually reminds me of like what Dane Cook said he was going to name his first child. First child, boy or girl, whatever. I'm naming it. That's it. Just. <laughs> yeah, that was the name. Okay, well, I hope that went well for him. <laughs> Some people are like, who is that? But he was, you know. Some people will listen to this show and say, I never liked Dane Cook. He was never funny. And those people are wrong. Well, and entitled to their opinions. <laughs> Complicated character, I would say. Oh, no question about that. No <laughs> question about that. All right. Well, let's jump into the episode. Today on the show, we have Michael Pace. Dr. Michael Pace is an executive assistant professor of management. He teaches introduction to business, project management, and the strategic management capstone course. He is also a faculty affiliate of the Texas A&M's Energy Institute, where he teaches graduate courses in project and portfolio management and sits on the board of directors of the Internal Project Management Association of the USA. That sounds like those meetings could be very interesting. <laughs> Indeed. Indeed. Michael has enjoyed opportunities to speak on project management in several countries on multiple continents and published his first and contributed to a second book during 2020. Congratulations. That is a huge project. Dr. Yes. Pace's academic pursuits come after 15 years of experience in various industries, building project management offices and project management functions. He talks a lot about those on the show, some of the highs and lows and why people think they want project management management and then sometimes get a little grumpy about it. His portfolio includes everything from software deployments and product launches to market research to a Floyd Mayweather Jr. boxing event. In his free time, Michael spends time with his wife and two daughters, enjoys video games and books, and as he talks about on the show, The Office, very much. He volunteers with the Girl Scouts of America and has talked about some of his lessons learned there on the show as well. We hope you enjoy the episode. Let's get into it. And it's a beautiful day in Aggieland. It really is. Enjoy the show. Michael, you and me. Hi. How's it going? It's early, but it's uh, going really well. What is your favorite superpower? There is a new storyline in which the character has reincarnation as her mutant power. Uh, okay. but she remembers everything from each prior life. And I thought that would be a really cool power to have, this reincarnation with perfect recall. That's, that is a great power indeed. It's, it's, it's a little bit like a better version of Groundhog Day or Edge of Tomorrow. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because it's not the, the same day over and over. It's, it, and you get to learn and, and um, you're a new person each time, but you remember everything. I was like, I could, I could be a professor now and a lawyer then, and I could come back and be selfish one life and not selfish the next life. Um, not, I, don't, I don't know that selfish would work out very well, but you never know, right? I mean, uh, it's, sometimes it's a more successful strategy than uh, any of us would like. <laughs> Give us 60 seconds on your road to Maze, if you would. Most of my trip to Maze is kind of backwards, to be honest. Um, bachelor's and master's degree in forensic science. First job out of college was a toxicology lab, startup. Um, got some great mentors that let me play with, with how I work. Uh, 
created project management at that company, left there, went to National Jewish Health, left there, went to Dish Network, left there, went to Texas A&M Division of IT, and then wound up uh, over here at Mays uh, teaching management courses. Um, that, that is a, a really interesting road. Um, we'll, we'll, get into, we'll get into some more of the details, but let's back up momentarily. Where did you grow up? Grew up in Baytown, Texas. How many in your family? I have a uh, mom, dad, brother, wife, two daughters, and then it kind of grows exponentially from there with uh, uh, brother's family, wife's family, um, pretty big extended family. Yeah. What was your greatest challenge as a child? To be honest, it was probably asthma. Um, I have suffered from asthma most of my life. I missed uh, three months of school when I was in high school because of it. Uh, the doctor said I was actually too sick to go to school, so I was homeschooled for a while. Um, and it's uh, been an interesting challenge that I had to try to work around. Yeah. Definitely. Sorry you have to deal with that. Your first job out of school. Let's go back to that. First job out of school. So I graduated with uh, two degrees in forensic science. Yes. Started in a clinical toxicology laboratory. It was a startup. I was employee 15 or 16, depending on what order you count people in. Yep. It was so small, the lab director, CEO said, we already have a Michael. You can't be Michael. I have to call you Mike. And um, for the next 10 years of my career, everyone in the company knew me as Mike. Makes sense. Yeah, uh, obviously, yeah, right? So, um, uh, it, uh, the summer after I started, so about eight months after I started, they got an influx of capital. And so, this entrepreneurial, uh, entrepreneurial spirit that we teach here at Maze now, I, I got to witness firsthand. And um, it grew from 16 to 800 over the course of its, um, of its life cycle. I got to do some pretty cool stuff uh, because of that. Any funny stories from that, uh, from that startup experience? <sighs> Countless, to be honest. Um, yeah, uh, every morning I used to walk in and I would say, good morning, Dr. Backer. And he would say, what's good about it? But uh, <laughs> part of, part of the, the entrepreneurial, uh, the entrepreneurism, say that three times fast on a Monday morning, right? But right. Uh, they don't teach you some of the things that you do when you're in a startup. Like uh, one afternoon, the CEO of the company walks in with a plunger and a mop. And says, "Come on, boys, let's go." And someone had clogged up the this toilet. Doesn't sound good. Uh, no, yep, okay. So he's PhD. He's a, a American board of forensic toxicologist, diplomat, world renowned toxicology guy. And him and me and this other guy are cleaning up bathroom overflow together. Yeah, it was a bonding moment, I think. All right. Startups, ladies and gentlemen. So as you, as we've discussed, two or two of your three degrees are in forensics and you were headed the CSI route and you talked briefly earlier about kind of ending up in business and project management. Um, what, what was this describe that process, I guess, describe that thought process for the second time. Yeah. Uh, I think I fell into project management like everybody else does backwards. Um, it's kind of a surprising factor that no one, well, years ago, no one went to school for, for project management. Um, uh, the great thing about a startup was when a problem happened, they let you jump in and solve it. And it turns out I was really good at solving problems. Um, I got to, to patent a computer system. I got to write some stuff. Uh, I got to train hundreds and hundreds of people and talk to medical doctors. Uh, and it provided a lot of opportunity. And it turns out a lot of what I was doing was called project management. Um, didn't know that at the time. So built a project management office, quote unquote, there. And turns out I was uh, pretty good at what's, what's, what's called a project. Um, um, led the company's biggest initiatives and then carried that to, to multiple companies. And then eventually I went back and got my PhD in business specializing in project management because I just think it's, it's incredibly neat, uh, this world of, of projects. Mm. What, were there any elements of that whole evolution that kind of took you by surprise or made you say, oh, this is not what I expected? Constantly. Yeah, constantly. <clears throat> um, I think one of the biggest uh, moments, like learning opportunities, is people assume project management is all technical, all hard skills, but it, it's all people. 
Um, I tell some of my, my, I tell most of my students now, um, if you could get a minor in something, do it in psychology uh, hmm. because you have to figure out the motivation of people. How do you work well with others? Who's the narcissist and who's the, the passive aggressive person? Um, all of the different personality traits, which, I mean, I could teach you how to run a Gantt chart and how to do a critical path and we can run Scrum and I could throw technical jargon at you and sound really intelligent. But at the end of the day, it's all, all about people and getting people moving forward in the same direction toward a common goal. Um, and I'm, I, I'm hesitant to say it, but people can suck. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we have a, a potential for greatness. We could do awesome things. They put a man on the moon. We've sent spacecrafts past Pluto, which I'm still upset. It's not a planet, uh, but <laughs> we, we've done really cool stuff. Um, Japan landed a, a, a satellite on an asteroid and then brought back samples, right? Yeah. And then I just, then we find Karens in a grocery store yelling about a mask. I'm just like, people are interesting. Yeah, there, there's... There's a reference. What you're talking about reminds me of, you know, people can suck like and people can be just amazing at times. And it's it's all part of the same tapestry, I guess. What you said reminds me of something I saw in a rule book from a role playing game when I was a teenager um, that has stuck with me all the way into I guess. I mean, I'm uh, approaching middle age now. So, uh, so yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll come back to it. Before you jump off of that, I think it's, I think that in and of itself is really important that um, when I teach students, I try to give them as many pieces of information because you never know when that one thing is going to come back and hit you. And yeah. you're telling me like, 20 years ago, I read a rule book of a, a Dungeons and Dragons and this one sentence stuck out to me that all the rest of my life. And, and I hope, I'm gonna be honest, I hope my students do something like that. Like Dr. Pace told me this Japanese saying once and it just really stuck with me, but it, it could be, you know, people suck. I mean, or, or what's good about it? Like, <laughs> it's random what sticks with you throughout life. Sure, sure. Following on that, why is project management important to the world? At its most basic level, uh, project management, when done correctly, only adds benefits. Mm -hmm. um, that's the headline. That's the short version. Yeah. Um, people, I think, have an innate desire to, to help organize things, to, to, to do better. Um, there are, you look at Netflix, you look at Prime, you look at Hulu, you look at TV. There's all these shows that people actually will just sit around and watch other people help others get organized. Yeah, like my yeah. wife watches this show called The Home Edit. Yeah. And it, this pair of ladies has a business where they're like, oh, look, a celebrity, I'm going to organize your pantry or I'm going to order, organize your refrigerator. And people watch this and it's really successful. Or Marie, um, Marie Kondo has books about organization. Uh, but the second you do it in a workplace, everybody goes, no, 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 no. So it, it, I actually, I selfishly call it the pace principle of project management. Everybody wants project management until they get managed. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I agree with that. Um, I feel like the more self-aware people are, the more forensic, if you will, they can be about which parts of their business lives they want managed. And in some cases, which parts of their personal lives they want managed. Um, for example, uh, the, so my, my wife who is amazing handles our, uh, social schedule for the most part. And what that means is I don't have to really do m much of the work, even with my family, of coordinating events and things like that. The other side of that is that my job is to say yes. And it's like, I, I don't really get a whole lot of, uh, I don't really get a whole lot of veto power. I show up with a smile on and, uh, and that's, that, that is just how we do things. Some couples, it would be the opposite. Um, and, or, or they would share duties or something. Uh, but, but if you want to, and I think the reason what I'm, what I'm getting at is I think the reason that many people realize they actually didn't want to be project managed is because they hadn't considered the implications of the management. Like what's the trade that you're making for that? Um, 
And you have to be able to think a few steps ahead and say, all right, this is what I get. This is what I have to give. Or maybe I could give this instead. Uh, but there's always, there's always something, there's always a give and take. Yeah. Uh, there's a light bulb moment, I think, that comes in a lot of projects. Um, uh, like I, when I was working for Dish, we did this massive website redesign. And the vice president said, we're going to be agile. And I said, great, I got gotcha. you. And I started setting up all the meetings and the, the, the stand-ups and trying to put together the backlog all the project management management stuff. And he goes, no, 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 we're agile. And I said, let's talk about what agile means to you. <laughs> and that there was that light bulb of, oh, you don't, you don't really want management. You just want the buzzword. Um, it happened a couple of times at Dish. It's happened at the lab. It happened at National Jewish, that light bulb of, oh, you're going to tell me what to do now. Gotcha. Right. Yeah, yeah. Out of curiosity, what did agile mean to this, to this person? Here, here's my selfish opinion. Uh, Agile means we go fast and we don't write things down. Uh, <laughs> and the, the Agile purists would say, no, 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 that's not exact. And I would agree with them. That's not Agile at all. But there's a, there's a um, waterfall, traditional project management. You write a lot of stuff down and they think it's very bureaucratic from a process perspective. But Agile swings the total opposite direction that, you focus heavily on process. You control the process and it allows for change and it allows great change to happen. Uh, but you, you sacrifice some of that freedom of, okay, every day I'm going to do this and every other Wednesday I'm going to do that. And every other Friday I'm going to do this. Um, and a lot of the agile methods, it's very structured and you give up a lot of freedom in order to achieve uh, that, that, that change availability. Um, it's all about give and take. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Tell us an example of a Netflix show that exemplifies why the world needs project management. In the U.S. specifically, um, there is such this individualistic nature yeah. and we don't want people to tell us what to do. But like I said, you go on, on TV and you can see lots of shows that are all about organizing. Mm -hmm. Or if you look, I mean, it could be, like I said, that, that home edit where the pair goes in and says, I'm going to fix your refrigerator yeah. um, or your pantry. Um, even if you look at like tiny house nation and the, the idea of tiny houses, it is all about getting rid of the junk that doesn't matter and focusing on what does matter. And, and to some extent, that's all really what, good project management is about you focus on what matters and then you get rid of all the other extra so junk kind of a kind of a warren buffett approach to things just start saying no to everything that's not right at the top of your, your list yeah um there is a huge power in the ability to mm -hmm. say no uh, i i teach that to my undergrads it's like you, you say no say no as often as you can um if you look at some of the project management processes, I think that that bureaucratic nightmare that people fear is at one point in time, somebody said, I want you to build me this thing. And the project manager didn't say no to anything. And at the end they said, well, I didn't ask for that. So you start writing stuff down, you start telling people, no, you start implementing change requests and all of these processes and documents because people are going to forget. Um, a lot of it is saying no. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What happens when project management goes wrong? A lot of funny stories. Yeah, <laughs> I, uh, so I would here, imagine. Uh, here's your startling statistic, Ben. 80% uh, of projects fail. Huh. Uh, it's been that way since the first measurement was in 1992, 1993. Same measurement for, for 20 years, 80% uh, fail. Um, and it can, uh, uh, one survey said that up to 17% of projects have gone so bad that they threaten the existence, existence of, of the company itself. Okay. Uh, is most cases not that bad, right? Uh, sometimes it's just learning a, a huge lesson. Um, I, I, I've got lots of horror stories in my background of, oh, that, uh, that shouldn't have happened. And, um, when projects fail, it's a learning opportunity for people. Yeah. What was your worst project ever or your worst experience associated with a project? We were doing a product launch back at the laboratory. Um, and I feel pretty safe talking about it because they, after I left, they uh, went bankrupt due to, due to some really bad management. But, uh, <laughs> but that's another story. That's a whole other story. Um, but uh, 
I'm leading a, a project launch or a product launch rather. There's 34 people on this conference call. We've got people across the U.S. Uh, dialed in, chief medical officer, uh, chief information officer, uh, countless vice presidents. Uh, each of them has their own little subordinates. So um, we are running into a challenge uh, and like a good project manager, all I want to do is get to the bottom of it. And I start the call and I say, thanks everybody for jumping in. Let's just get into it. Um, IT's run into a challenge here um, and, and we just need to talk about what do we want to do. And I said, do you want to talk about it to the chief medical officer? And he says, thanks, Mike, and proceeds to berate the chief information officer and his entire IT team. And then the CIO uh, rightfully starts protecting his team. Yeah. I mean, it was such a, a horrible 27 minutes of them yelling at each other. Uh, the medical team hadn't provided good scope and clarification. The IT team was incompetent. Um, neither statement was true, but it became very emotionally filled. Yeah. Um, so... It, it was the worst meeting ever. Um, I got called into the principal's office, had to go explain to the CFO why I had, had done that. And I, um, I, I learned a few things though. And I think that's what's important when you talk about project failure in general, you should learn something from it. Um, and I learned here that for every one meeting that you have, there's actually three meetings occurring, um, whether you know it or not. There's always a pre-meeting people are going to meet beforehand to talk about what's going to happen in that meeting. They're going to gear up. Um, there's very much a tribal mentality of let's circle the wagons and let's get ready for this. And if we're going to get attacked, we're ready to go. Sure. And then there's that post meeting as well of all the stuff that didn't get talked about, or if the meeting goes sideways like that one did, I'm going to talk with my friends about how bad that was and then circulate that. And as a project manager is a good one. You have to be cognizant of not just that one meeting. Every meeting is, is this, this sandwich of three and yeah. you have to control all of them at, if you can. Your headline project right now is leading May's students in project managing the world's largest student led disaster simulation. They would correct me and say it's not the world, it's the nations, but I would, so it's probably probably the world's is pretty safe. Yeah. Uh, Health Science Center and its composite schools, College of Medicine, Nursing, Public Health, yeah. et cetera. Um, I'm going to leave out one, so I'll just stop at three because I think there's five or six. Um, have been leading what's called Disaster Day. Um, I yeah. We're on uh, event number 13. <laughs> They get together and they plan this huge simulation out here at Disaster City and College Station. Uh, essentially, they do a mock disaster. And the medical yes. students, nursing students, pharmacy students have to respond. Uh, yeah. A couple of years ago, it was a biohazard lab explosion. And so they're triaging patients out there and they're taking them to the field hospital. Um, one year it was a train wreck. One year it was a tornado. And so the idea is interprofessional development, getting the the doctor students and the nursing students and the pharmacy students to all work together. The interprofessional education and research department, IPER, I think that's the acronym there, reached out to us a couple of years and said, look, we're doing good. It's a great event. We want to be better. And we want somebody to come in and help us. It's student led. Do you have students that could help us? Um, and the email kind of bounced back and forth. It landed on my desk and I said, absolutely. Um, and it's such a cool experience. This, I just, I send these project management students out there and I say, go. Um, and, and it's an experiential learning for them of how to actually manage a project um, and how do you work well with other people? Um, and where's the value add versus the, the, the non-value add? Yeah. What do you think is the biggest value add for your students from doing this? So my students giving to the health science center folks, they're trying to be doctors and nurses and scientists. They are not business folks. Right. And so they bring this different mindset altogether of simple things. Um, first thing we implemented meeting agendas and meeting minutes, mm. which in the business world, you're like, yeah, they've been doing this for 10 years at the time, 11 years, and they don't have meeting minutes. And so each year they're reinventing everything. Yeah. 
So we focus on the simple, easy wins, low hanging fruit, I think is the, the normal cliche, right? Yeah. Meeting minutes or process or documentation and the business units bring this new mindset to these health science center folks and it just makes their job easier. Hmm. Yeah, I like that. What What's something that your management students have taught you this year? It's a weird one. I got to be honest, but, um, or maybe a depressing one, but uh, the power of compassion. Okay. And I'll explain a little bit. Uh, I, I, I don't like tests. I, I refuse to do tests uh, wherever possible, but I would ask them on these regular quizzes, uh, an open-ended short answer, how are you? Hmm. Uh, and I've got two, 300 students, but I re- read each and every response when they put it out there. You, some of them are like, I'm fine, that's it. But some of them would write a paragraph of here's what's going on in my life. Um, and after the second or third one, they, they started saying, I know you don't have time to respond. I just want you to know how much it means that you're asking this question. Hmm. You know, some, you know, some students have classes where the professor never learns their name or they, they um, I had a, a student tell me that for most of her classes in the spring, her and her roommate would sit out in a pool in their backyard with their cameras off because the professor would take attendance, but they're drinking beer in a pool with the, the, the audio going. Um, and I, I, there's just this, just caring. There's just such a power in just remembering that we're all humans in this. Yeah. Yeah. The story that, the story that always sticks in my mind is uh, Keith Ferrazzi talks in his book, never eat alone about calling people on their birthdays. And I don't think you always have to make a phone call, especially in, you know, 2021. Uh, But just like doing something beyond writing a message on somebody's Facebook wall, that's going to blend into the other, you know, 150, messages that they're going to get or whatever the number is, uh, but actually taking the time to send them a message or even just send them a text if it's somebody you don't know as well. But he called uh, a guy on his birthday, you know, years back. And when after he had said happy birthday and I wanted to see how you were doing, there's silence on the other end of the line. And he thinks, I got the wrong day. Uh, something, something went ter- terribly wrong here. And then he says, you know, Joe, are you, are you there? And he realizes the person on the other end of the line is crying and, uh, and eventually says, um, you're the only person who called me on my birthday this year. Uh, and this was, you know, this was just, this was just a, a business acquaintance. Um, but, you never know when a gesture like that is going to save somebody's life. The number of students who admitted that they have depression and anxiety, um, it's, 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 it's worrisome. And so some of the people yeah. just asking how they are, it's uh, like the lead in, like I said, it's either a really cool thing or really depressing thing that, that um, um, I, I bring up the office a lot in my classes and uh, it's kind of got, got this renaissance going, but Michael Scott, the most inept manager ever, great salesman. And on his Rolodex, he would have these key things um, uh, about the people. Uh, and of course it was like green means go ahead and never mention it. Like it, it didn't make any sense to anybody else. Link in the bottom here uh, to Peacock now that it's off of Netflix. Right. But uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> that simple stuff that that has been around for for eons of just we're all humans in this yeah if you want to segue back into projects like the the best project tool uh people are always you know, if you google your you'll, you'll get software but the best project thing that you can do is walk up to somebody's desk and say hey how's it going um, the best project managers never sit at their desk because they're at everybody else's desk talking and figuring out what's going on in the project. How are they feeling? Cause that's where you get the, the, the nuts and bolts of it. Yeah. Yeah. Really, really uh, coming to understand where people are in life and what is important to them. The, those are two of the most important things you can do in project management or in leadership really. Um, because expectancy theory is all built around what do people actually want? Um, there's all kinds of management theories that, that students, 18 and 19 year old kids are like, why do I need to know this? I'm like, you just brought up expectancy theory. 
I could bring up Maslow and Herzberg and 3X, Y, and Z, and all this stuff comes back. Like, it, it matters. Mm-hmm. It hugely matters. Yeah. You volunteer with the Girl Scouts of America. Tell us a little bit about that. I told my wife I was going to talk about, because um, you sent me the, the pre-questions, and she laughed at me. Just She was like, I can't believe you're talking about the Girl Scouts. And I was like, why not? It's awesome. Yeah. Um, I, was, I was never a Boy Scout. I think it's really cool the number of options that that the Girl Scouts provides. Uh, just within the last year, my girls have been able to do STEM. Uh, they designed a car, like sculpting it, and, and then one daughter uh, started coding, like wrote a game. Uh, my, uh, my youngest just donated 13 inches of hair, got a badge for it, and a thank you letter that says thank you so much, and the meaningfulness uh, uh, behind that. Uh, when you, I think when a lot of people think Girl Scouts, they think Girl Scout cookies. But uh, yeah, the, the, the number of resources available for, for girls, um, which if you look, we're, we're at the bottom of the barrel when we talk about education in general across the, the planet. But when you look at girls especially, I think there's a, a huge gap that needs to be filled. And it's really neat that my daughters, um, they have Aggie Sports Day, and they get to go hang out with the women's soccer or women. It's football or not football, a basketball team, women's softball team. And they say, I'm a successful young woman. Here's what you need to do in the next 10 years, 20 years, however, however old. Um, or they get to hang out with an engineer from NASA and say, okay, I'm a girl. And uh, I was your age once and let's talk. So it's just so cool that what they're able to, to get exposure to just being a Girl Scout. Yeah. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, what what has been the most surprising experience or thing you've learned since beginning your volunteer process with the organization? It is a cutthroat world. Uh, uh, I'll bring up the Girl Scout cookie thing again. Yeah. The incredible, uh, this is the project manager in me, right? But they have a schedule that you're only allowed to go on certain days at certain times. You can only say certain words. You can't go to, to sell it on Texas A&M campus because of X, Y, and Z. Uh, the, the rules that they put out and the girls are just like, yeah. And then they do it all. Um, so you've got 10 and 12 year old kids that are in charge of this thing. And I was like, when I was 10 years old, I was play, playing Mario. Um, and yeah. um, playing games and, and goofing off. And I didn't know how to make change for a 20. Uh, I, I probably did because people like Dr. Pace doesn't know how to make change. But um, I make the joke, I went to Baylor, I don't do math. But uh, I really do know a little bit about math. Um, but yeah, they, they just, they run it all. And it's very cutthroat uh, uh, how it's managed. Yeah. Let's, uh, let's move to rapid fire. What important truth do very few people agree with you on? I'm going to assume they don't agree. Uh, higher education is broken. What have you recently tried to teach yourself? Uh, storytelling, the art of building a story. What do you think is people's biggest misconception of you? For students, at least, I think it is that I am an easy professor. Hmm. Anyone you would like to send good bull? I'll give a shout out, as the kids these days say, right? Um, yeah. Mad props. No, no. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, give good bull to, to my colleague up here, uh, Ken McFarland. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good bull to uh, good bull to Ken. I. Uh, Michael, thank you so much for joining us. We, what a great conversation. We appreciate your time. I appreciate your time. Uh, and good bull to you. Thanks, Ben. I hope you enjoyed the episode with Dr. Pace. For our Mastercast top three takeaways, I wanted to start with the idea that everyone wants project management until they get managed. And that was, I think he said that was the Pace like slogan or, or something, motto or something like that. But everyone wants project management until they get managed. And I can certainly sympathize with that. I don't want people to tell me what to do, but I also want everything to be organized. Yeah, there's there's also kind of a contrapositive. I don't I don't know what the logical 
connection is. But everybody wants to be an entrepreneur until they find out you still have a boss. It's just the market and it, and it only speaks through its actions and won't actually you know tell you what to do, but you have to figure out what it is telling you to do. But yeah, it, it's kind of the question of do you do you want guidance or do you not? How how explicit do you want your guidance to be? And I think many people are wrong about how explicit they want their guidance to be. One of the things that I've learned on some of the teams that I've managed is that people really want other people to be project managed and they do not want themselves to be project managed. So they're like, I really want to know when that person's going to turn in that thing. And I really want to know if they're working on it and what progress they're making. But I don't want to have to document that for myself (laughs) because I trust myself. But that other person isn't getting their job done. Yeah. And one thing that's kind of noteworthy about all of that is if you don't have project management already in place, you can kind of impart your own sort of de facto project management just by communicating clearly and asking a bunch of questions. You know, how is this supposed to be done? You know, what's a reasonable time frame? You know, my brother David taught me the when setting expectations, what's a reasonable time frame for this to be completed in right up front? Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I learned that learned that trick from him. And it's amazing how much you can, how much leadership you can build into a process, even where you have no, in theory, you have no authority at all, just by phrasing your leadership in the form of questions. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, I think that's really important. I also think there's a lot of value in the reflection after kind of after project reflection, but there's also a lot of value in kind of after action reflection or once a project is done or once a week is done even to sit down with the team and say what went well, what could have gone better. And one of the for my second takeaway, one of the things that Michael talked about was a project management experience that didn't go well, where someone on the team started berating the IT group. And one of the things that I really learned from a project management perspective or a team management perspective is to focus on the process and not the people and to say what process needs to be in place that's going to make sure that mistake doesn't happen again or that that shortcoming doesn't happen again or that we can capitalize on this great thing that happened this week. What's the process that needs to be in place to do that and not focus on the people as much, uh, which is really helpful for kind of being more objective about how that project can move forward. Yeah, I think the biggest challenge in many of those situations is to make it as impersonal as possible. And the faster you can get out of the kind of whether it's in the past or in the future, the faster you can make it clear we're not assigning blame. One of Steve Tinkle's favorite phrases, autopsy without blame. And there's really an art and and a science, obviously, as well, to getting things to a very objective state so everyone feels like no matter what happened, we're all solving this problem together. And I think what you're talking about speaks to that. Yeah, no, for sure. I like that autopsy without blame. I think that that's a good a good way to think about it. For our last takeaway, I was really surprised that 80% of projects fail. It's a really high number. Yeah. After I thought about it for a minute, projects can be big and small and fail in all kinds of different ways. But the fact that 80% of projects fail is really interesting. Yeah, it doesn't surprise me quite as much because I feel like really what it is, if you look at projects and compare them to companies, for example, and you say, you know, 80% of startups fail in the first year and and another, you know, another 50% or 75% fail within five years. So by the time all is said and done, you're looking at like within five years, something like 95% of companies fail. Yeah. I actually think that the numbers are lower for failure in the first year because a lot of companies can kind of survive (laughs) for longer than maybe they should. But I think it was closer to like 20% fail in the first year. But then the the numbers catch up to what you were saying on the five-year horizon. Okay. So... If you're thinking about it, though, in terms of so we can lump all of these things Mm -hmm. together in terms of innovations. Mm -hmm. And if you consider a 
project as a form of innovation, what that means is that a project is something that involves enough of a new way of thinking that you actually have to sort of assign it its own intellectual property in some way, Mm -hmm. rather than treating it as more of an evolution and just saying, we're going to tweak what we're doing in order to make this part of our system work in a slightly different way. It involves saying we need to rethink the whole way we're approaching this and both a project and a company involve kind of that way of thinking, whether you're, you know, a company may be going into like taking an existing service or product into a new market or it may be developing an entirely new product or service. But I think there's definitely a parallel there between projects and companies in the sense of we're doing something new here something very new in some way or another, or we're, we're ch- really changing the way we're approaching an existing something and assigning it that distinction actually is an admission that the odds are against us in this respect. And we may need several shots at fixing this problem. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I know. I think that's, that's a good way to frame it, to think about you know, each project is almost its own business or business adventure innovation. I think that's a a good way to think about it. My sister and I, for our business this fall, we hired someone to help us with building out a sales funnel. And she used Trello for a project management tool. And I'm sure that Dr. Pace would roll his eyes probably at Trello because it, it is probably a very basic project management tool. But for us being inexperienced in project management and not having a process in place, it was really, really helpful for us to have deadlines in there. We could communicate really effectively. Um, I've used Basecamp before and not found it very helpful. But Trello was really helpful in being able to tag each other on things. We could link to Google Drive really effectively. And it's a great visual representation of what needs to be done when, by whom, related to what, and what are we trying to accomplish. And it really helped us. We've actually continued now to use it going forward on our own now that our specific project ended, but we're using it, continuing to use it going forward. And it's helping us to really stay on track and stay focused. And I found it to be a very useful and free tool if people are looking for something to use. Yeah, Kyle and I have gotten a lot of utility out of Trello as well. Shameless plug for our podcasting service, Podcast Architects. If you're looking to start a podcast, hit us up. But also Trello, even just sort of the simple horizontal, vertical, you know, tabular interface, there's not a lot of like it doesn't look magical or anything. It's not visually fancy, but it is super, super helpful. Yeah, it's been really, really helpful in keeping us, like I said, organized, keeping the project moving forward, knowing what we're trying. I really like checklists. So building checklists in Trello has been helpful and just feeling like, oh, I've clicked off six of the 12 tasks. That feels so nice. You know, just all of it is it, it gets at what I think Michael said about kind of the psychology of people, right? And and how integrated that needs to be in project management and thinking about what's going to get people motivated to participate and engage. Because the truth is, a lot of our project management efforts, when I've done that with other teams, have failed because not everybody is bought into the idea of engaging in this project management system. And if my sister and I, you know, in this small context of our business, if we're not both engaged with this project management system, there's no point to it. Um, Like with you and Kyle, if you're not both contributing to it, looking at it, working through it, then it doesn't, it's not useful. And that's harder, I think, when you get to a bigger team, if it's not part of the team culture already to say, this is what we're going to do. It's hard to create that culture within the organization. Yeah, no question. And the other place that I feel like organizations fail is in tweaking the expectancies as, you know, because it's not like not only is your value proposition going to change over time, our value proposition has changed tremendously. We're much more focused on educational institutions, school districts, I think working with community colleges and, you know, business schools or colleges at other universities is kind of where we're going to end up. But also the way that that we've gone about the day-to-day business of doing things has been kind of similar, but somewhat different in other respects. And we're having to take another look at, all right, how are we handling compensation? How are we handling ownership? Like, how are we handling process? Mm -hmm. And 
you just have to be constantly re-examining that um, or your project will not work out. Yeah. Yeah. It's great. Really appreciated uh, Dr. Pace's insights. Would you like to close us with a quote? I would love to close us with a quote. Everything has its wonders, even darkness and silence. And I learn whatever state I may be in, therein to be content. Helen Keller. Thanks for listening. An MBA from Texas A&M University can take your career to a whole new level. With full-time and weekend options, Texas A&M suits your schedule. So get a better gig. Visit mba.tamu.edu. Looking to start a podcast? Trying to tackle questions like, how do I record? How do I edit? How can I get music for my show? What equipment do I need? How do I distribute it? Good news. The podcast architects are here to help. Whether that's from start to finish, fixing the audio quality, helping you get the episodes posted, go to podconsulting.co. Everyone has something worth sharing with the world.